This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. On this June 9th, we welcome you to a special Pride edition of Real Talk. Our Friday Roundtable welcomes three individuals with lived experience, three individuals with advocacy experience. They're community organizers, and each of them brings to the table today a different perspective on why Pride is important. I wanted to let you know quickly, if you tuned into or perhaps missed my exclusive yesterday with Alberta Premier Danielle Smith right here in studio. Studio. There's been one fact check in particular that's been brought to our attention, and we will present that today in a special edition of Trash Talk, presented by our friends at Local Environmental Services. That's how we'll wrap up today's edition of Real Talk. Before we get the ball rolling on the roundtable, I want to give a quick heads up here. This is a bit of a red flag. You know, learner fraud, this is a big problem. Forged certificates, uncredentialed workers They can pose significant risks to organizations, uh, potentially resulting in legal liabilities, reputational damage, and of course, a workforce that lacks the necessary skills and qualifications to succeed. That's why it's absolutely critical to partner with a trusted provider like We Know Training. At We Know Training, they're dedicated to helping organizations mitigate these risks, building a competent, skilled workforce. Their industry-leading learner verification and digital credential solutions enable you to easily verify learners, issue and share credentials, and set up automated reminders to ensure that your workforce remains compliant and up-to-date. By partnering with We Know Training, you can save valuable time and resources. You can reduce administrative burdens and most importantly, ensure that your organization is always one step ahead of the competition. So why wait? Contact We Know Training today to learn how they can help you take your workforce to the next level at weknowtraining.ca. Well, you probably know that it's Pride Month. Perhaps your community has seen a new crosswalk painted. Perhaps you've got an event coming up this weekend. Hell, maybe you're hosting one of them. But still, we see evidence all around us that the work here is not done. As a matter of fact, through the course of today's episode, you're going to hear some emails from real talkers that have been in touch with the show over the past couple of weeks, chiming in from their communities, letting us know about, yeah, some of the positive developments, but also some of the discouraging things that they're witnessing firsthand. We're going to put that in front of our panelists, and I'm expecting a candid and meaningful conversation over these next number of minutes. Angela Glacel is a member of the queer community as well as a member of Robertson Wesley United Church, an affirming and inclusive faith community in the downtown Edmonton area. Angela is also the organizer of the upcoming Community and Connection uh, LGBTQ2S Plus Advocacy Conference, and we're going to get into the details on that. That's coming up uh, in about a week from right now. Uh, Becca Marcellus is a community outreach worker for Out Loud St. Albert. I can't wait to learn more about that organization. Uh, When not running programming or planning events, uh, Becca spends her time building relationships with schools and community stakeholders to increase the number of safer spaces for Out Loud's youth. And Basil Abu Hamra is a settlement practitioner uh, specializing in LGBTQ plus complex cases at the Edmonton Mennonite Center for Newcomers. Uh, Basil arrived in Canada as a refugee from Syria in 2015, not that long ago, actually. Uh, And he's played a key role in establishing what's known as the Rainbow Refugee Program. It's the first of its kind in Alberta's capital city, uh, providing immigration and settlement supports uh, to LGBTQ plus newcomers and refugees in particular. Basil also serves as one of the co-leaders of the LGBTQ plus newcomer Edmonton group. Uh, To the three of you, a very warm welcome and and happy pride. Uh, Angela, to you, uh, people say, and and you you oftentimes see it as, as a reminder as a celebration and as a challenge pride was founded in or pride is protest Mm -hmm. what does pride mean to you um pride still means that we exist and we are still protesting so many things and i think it's really interesting because if you don't if you're not necessarily part of the queer community and your lived experience is different you just take for granted that you know everything is sort of fine and everything is sort of good so pride is just um, really recognizing that we're still 
you know, having all these complex issues and we're facing all of these um, different things that are happening right now and not all of them very good. Mm. Yeah. Uh, we'll follow up on that, obviously, mm -hmm. in a second. Uh, Becca, what does pride mean to you personally? Um, yeah, I think in a lot of ways we're sort of returning to our protest roots um, just with some of the things going on, like you said, um, certain discouraging messages um, coming from some people. Uh, but it's also a reminder for members of the queer community and especially our youth that they um, have value exactly as they are and that they are loved and they're a manifestation of joy. Mm. Mm. Basil. For me, uh, I think it is uh, to be proud of how uh, far we have come. And also, it's a reminder of the ongoing struggles faced by uh, LGBTQ individual face around the world. Um, and also, it's a call for action, um, uh, urging us uh, to advocate for more equality um, and uh, human rights. Can you tell us about, about the Rainbow Refugee Program? This is one I know that's going to resonate with, with, with a lot of people that maybe are unaware that uh, an initiative or a support like this exists. Okay, absolutely. But it's a long story. Is it okay? That's okay. That's what Real Talk's all about. <laughs> okay, perfect. So, um, uh, 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 me, I came to Canada uh, late 2015 as refugee from Syria. Uh, I wasn't out back home. I was fearing, uh, uh, living in fear all, all my life, hiding who truly I am. Uh, when I came here, I decided to to be out. I want to live authentically. I want to live um, my life. Um, but it took me a long time, actually, to come out because I was looking around and I didn't find uh, a space for us uh, LGBTQ refugees and the newcomers. Um, later on, um, uh, I was uh, introduced to other LGBTQ newcomers and uh, we all shared that this, there is no specific space for us here in Edmonton. So uh, we decided to make that happen and uh, we uh, started the LGBTQ newcomer group Edmonton uh, in 2015 and it's a social support group. We are family for each other. We meet weekly. We support each other. Um, but during the group time, we realized that there is more issues need to be addressed. And the group time, which is two hours every week, it's not uh, enough. And we don't have capacity to do that. So Bright Center and the Edmonton Midnight Center for Newcomers, they came together and they started the Rainbow Refuge program. Uh, so in this program, we support LGBTQ refugees and the newcomers with immigration, settlement, uh, um, accessing mental health uh, support, uh, how housing, employment, and many and many other services. 2015, 2016, what a huge time for you it in is. your life. You, you leave Syria, uh, which I, I have to imagine uh, in a way feels like your heart being ripped out of your chest. Mm -hmm. uh, if you talk to people who have, who have moved their entire life to a new country, a new culture, a new language, etc., mm -hmm. and you decide to come out, I mean, you're, what have the last eight years been like for you personally? It is... Um, a journey for me personally. Uh, uh, it's filled of lots of <laughs> emotions. Uh, I am proud of where I, I am right now, what I did, but also I grave that moments in my life that have been ripped uh, uh, from me, that been taken away, and I wasn't able to be who I am and uh, to, to live my life authentically. Angela, it's, uh, sometimes I find myself on these round tables watching somebody listen to somebody else, mm -hmm. and b you are just it seems captivated by what Bezel's bring to the table, what he's sharing with us right mm -hmm. now. Yeah, and I think it's a, you know, to share personal stories is a lot, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not always necessarily the easiest thing. Um, and that you're putting it into the work that you're doing, I think is incredible. Mm -hmm. Like when you take that and you move it into something else, that's beautiful. Yeah. Can I, uh, let me say this, and, and as someone who grew up in the church as well, and, mm -hmm. and you've got to be really careful when you start talking about the church, because there's a lot mm -hmm. of different churches mm -hmm. that follow a lot of different doctrine, that have a lot of different approaches mm -hmm. to a lot of different things, mm -hmm. including pride, right? Mm -hmm. And so with, with no disrespect intended to anybody that listens to this interview, you might suggest that when we say we've got a panelist joining our pride roundtable from mm -hmm. a church, they're going to go, mm -hmm. Which way is this going to go? Sure. Right? But your church, Robertson Wesley United Church, is actually hosting 
this conference coming up mm-hmm. in April. Did you grow up in the church? I did not, actually. Okay. So I didn't find it until about, um, like, my, my faith journey, my spiritual path, whatever you sort of want to call it, didn't really happen until about 2017 wow. when I walked into Robertson Wesley. So that has been my experience. Um, so I also have a lot of privilege in that because I didn't grow up in a church where you can get like harmful messages from a lot of different directions. Um, so my experience, like I said, is coming from a really privileged place because it's been very positive for uh, me. Can I, I'll let our audience know that, that mm-hmm. in circumstances like this, we've had a conversation ahead of time. We've all had coffee in the green room and talked. And so people are going to go, gosh, he's asking very personal questions <laughs> and just rat a tat tat one after the <laughs> other. Uh, I, I, I have, you know, you have given me the three of you, your, your permission for me to ask questions. And I have asked you that if a question goes too far for you to just push back. So let's just put mm-hmm. that on the record. So our audience knows. A lot of people would, would, would say someone, you know, someone that, that, that identifies as queer uh, to join a church as an adult might be an unusual circumstance. And again, yeah. I'll get we'll get a bunch of people, uh, members of a church or, or, or faith practitioners that will say, what are you talking about? Our church is wonderful and supportive, but others will know exactly what I mean. Mm-hmm. Did you see yourself as a young person ultimately joining a church? I mean, when, when you when you yeah. realized You know, I mean, everything that went into it and some of the the controversy and some of the, like you said, harmful messaging that we see. Mm -hmm. Did you see that coming as a development in your life? Oh, that I would end up being like the member of a church and fully participating in one? No. Coordinating a big event in the church and hosting a big thing? Oh, no, not at all. Right. Um, So it's surprising in some ways, but I had some other like personal kind of things happening at the same time that I see where it kind of led me Mm. to there. But I also know that I didn't end up somewhere else. Like I ended up at Robertson Wesley. Um, So I think there's something to say to that just for me as a person, because I found like community and belonging there, which would be, you know, that's not the case for everyone right and I mean not all united churches are considered like affirming ministries which are you know affirming is just like we're we're welcoming and inclusive and we like celebrate who you are um so but many united churches are but I just happened to find Roberts and Wesley because they really actively wanted to be affirming and that's one of the reasons why we're doing the conference is because we just didn't want to say we're something Mm. we wanted to actually be something and be in relationship so what would you say, by the way, for, for people that are going to be watching this and, and want to check out as we're talking this conference, learn a little bit more about it. They can check out community and connection dot com. I don't know how you got that URL community and connection dot com. That's very good. You guys got to hang on to that one and like keep it for like 30 years. What would you say to somebody that says faith and pride cannot run parallel? They are they are incongruous. Well, I would say it's everyone's personal experience, just in the sense of like. If someone feels that that's not something that comes together for them, that's fair, right? Like, I respect that. Like, I totally get that some people won't want to come to the conference because it's in a church. Like, it's being hosted in the church. Like, I fully respect that and understand that that's not something that's going to work for everyone, right? And so, but faith, you know, faith and spirituality matters to some people and it matters to some queer people. A hundred percent. What would you say to people of faith that would say pride is incongruous with faith? Uh, I would honestly question their faith. Like I wonder about um, sort of what they follow and what they've turned certain things into. I mean, people will often say, you know, it's my faith, it's my Christianity. But I mean, it's it comes out as being super harmful. So I would just sort of question about why not accepting and loving people, which is really, you know, what Jesus did, right? So you're turning it into something else for whatever your your sort of idea of mm. something is, mm. yeah. Um, I Gosh, I feel like we could talk about the Rainbow Refugee Program for an hour. <laughs> we could talk about faith and pride for an hour. Um, why do we make sure that we introduce the ethos of, of out loud St. Albert into this as well. And, and I want to circle back. I want to give you a heads up so you have some time to think about it. I want to talk to you about the assertion some folks will roll out that they love the sinner but hate the sin. Someone told me, someone shared with me, someone very close to me shared that with me last week, how harmful and hurtful that was when somebody said that to him. I think they thought they were saying it out of love, but he felt like it was a big, huge slap of the face. You know what I'm talking about? You know exactly what I'm talking about, I can tell. 
Talk to us about Out Loud St. Albert. This is a group that a lot of people, I've seen a lot of people when they talk about this group, their faces just like explode into smiles. What's this group all about? What's so special about it? That's always so wonderful to hear. Um, it's true. I'm yeah. Not... So we um, are actually almost 10 years old. Um, we've had staff for about two years. Out Loud was started in St. Albert by a dad um, whose kid had just recently come out and who didn't have anywhere to go for community. Uh, so he was like, okay, well, I'm a problem solver uh, and started the first group actually in the church um, in St. Albert. Um, and then they found some kids, you know, as you were talking about, weren't totally comfortable coming there. So they moved it to one of the schools. Uh, and now we have our own space. We see, you know, upwards of 60 kids um, at our group nights and, you know, new ones every <laughs> single time. Um, and there's just so much joy, like the staff all joke about, you know, the serotonin that we get from these kids um, and how it was really the place that we needed when we were their age. Right. So it's yeah, there's just so much joy bursting out of those walls. Um, and yeah, I get to go and speak at schools. I get to talk to teachers, to parents who want to better support their kids. Um, yeah, it's just a really, really wonderful way to connect with the community and just try to build as many safe spaces as we can for these kids. It's I was I always sort of you know feel this little jolt of energy when you when people like you um, talk about involvement of parents. Mm -hmm. Like parents want resources. Parents want to understand. Parents want to support their kids. Um, you know that this this sort of like the youth element of a lot of conversations around Pride or a lot of and and, and outside of Pride Month as well. Or what makes uh, so much of this conversation divisive? Like you, like drag story time. Like the, that, that's one example of, of how when people talk about the youth, mm -hmm. and then something gets torqued up a great degree. I don't know if the, you know the three of you are paying attention at the Maritime. So it's happening in uh, Nova Scotia right now. But the, you know this policy seven thirteen relating to um, students, non-binary students or transgender students that that would need to uh, seek parental permission um, if they wanted to. You know use you know identify under a different name or change their name on school documents and it's something that uh embattled premier higgin out there is having a real issue with with his caucus he had some ministers no show to meetings yesterday because they're not supporting the move that he and his education minister are making and it just reintroduces i think or reiterates here the importance of these conversations i mean what mm -hmm. it's like for you what's it like for you to see a family come in a family unit however you might define that as a parent or a couple of parents or a caregiver and a young person come in together and say, we want to better understand this together. We want to walk together through this journey. It's absolutely amazing. Um, I'm very lucky that I get to run the St. Albert chapter of PFLAG, um, which is a national organization for like parents and guardians. Uh, sometimes we'll get, you know, aunties, uncles, um, teachers. And it's just, yeah, for these grownups in these kids' lives to come and, you know, talk through their feelings, get support, um, just so they can be the best, most loving, supportive person for their kid that they can, because they also, like, the kids are seeing those same messages, right? They're seeing the posters you just put up. Like, yeah. we, um, I actually know the performer that was on that poster. Oh, for like real? the kids, yeah. This one here, yeah. If, if people are watching on yeah. YouTube, they're seeing this one, yeah. Coco's gonna be at St. Albert Pride, actually. They're a wonderful person, an amazing performer. Um, yeah, so the kids are seeing that, and it scares them. You know, let so, me give some background to what that yeah. is. So this is from Marlene, not her real name. We appreciate her emailing into the show. Um, by the way, to our audience, when we say it's not your real, whatever, some people request anonymity. We've still verified who the person is, just so you know. Um, but, but Marlene says, please keep me anonymous right now in our community of Spruce Grove. We've got a very disturbing flyer that's been found on cars at local churches and events. I wrestled, by the way, with, with the decision on whether or not to even show that flyer. What do you think? I, sometimes I feel like people need to see what we're talking about. And then sometimes I feel like we're just amplifying the, the, the harm. I don't know. Do you, have a, do you have a landing point on that? I think it really depends on your audience, right? Like if this was something directed at youth, I probably wouldn't. Mm. Um, but I think it is also, you know, especially for adults to see kind of the constant messaging yeah. that we are getting. Because it is, if you look at Out Loud social media, we try to keep on top of it, but we get the same stuff. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is an engaged and empathetic audience. I'll tell you that much. Mm -hmm. uh, so Marlene says this, this is now the talk of the city now on local chat group says I'm absolutely disgusted at the level of hate and misinformation uh, regarding this local pride event at a library. Um, Marlene takes a shot at a, a local city councilor who says that 
Um, Councillor Gillett's been spreading misinformation, lies about the event at the library, you know, talking about drag inherently demeaning to women and girls, presenting a character of women, advising them that natural female attributes are, per I'm going to let you respond to this, don't worry, uh, permissible targets for exaggeration, ridicule, appropriation. You know, they'd prefer events that do not expose uh, young children to grown men dressed as clownish versions of women, allowing them to read stories under the guise of normalizing gender fluidity. I mean, we've, we've heard enough here from Marlene, and I appreciate her email. I mean, what would you say to, to folks, not just in Spruce Grove, but, I mean, we know that this isn't limited to, to Alberta or even mm -hmm. to Canada. What would you want people thinking about? Yeah, I, I always find the drag story time people so funny. I saw one video that someone had posted and they were talking about, oh, the parents don't know what's going on in there. But you can clearly see in the video, like through the window into the drag story time and it's parents sitting with their kids. Um, so like, it's very, very easy to see <laughs> what's actually going on. But drag has been, you know, around for hundreds of years. I mean, you look at Shakespearean plays, like those were men in drag because women didn't act at the time. Like it has been going on forever and now we have drag kings and non-binary performers and it's just a way to play with gender and just like i don't know if these people have been to a drag show but they're very fun yeah <laughs> yeah I, I, I don't know if there's anything more fun than a really good drag show to be honest with you but i mean everything's <laughs> everything's politicized right everything's absolutely and and fear and anger sells and works unfortunately more than anything else oh absolutely yeah you know? and people are afraid right now there's so much going on with you know cost of living and everything being politicized and just so many different issues that they need kind of something to focus their fear towards and the queer community has become a really easy target i mean it's a target that's been you know used throughout history basil you, you shared with us that you know growing up in syria um you you were and i don't want to put words in your mouth but i think mm -hmm. you you told us that you were you were fearful or you were you were concerned about about coming out about mm -hmm. you know living your authentic life mm -hmm. you might say can you give us some insight into, and, and it's certainly not limited to Syria. Is that, a, is that a Syrian culture thing? Is it more of a conservative culture? I mean, certainly that region uh, we know is. Uh, and can you talk about yeah. young people and the young, the experience of young people growing up there? And when you hear of supports, like what Becca's talking about, what they have meant, what that may have meant to you, had those been available? I wish that support was existing uh, back home. But just to, to get back to your question, Syria is a liberal country, by the way. There, uh, there is not much conservative like other Middle Eastern uh, countries. Many religion that live in, in unity. That was Syria before the war. Um, however, uh, the LGBTQ topic, being gay, it's not uh, something accepted by the church or the mosque or synagogue. They, they weren't accepting uh, us. So my life there was living a lie every day. I have to act uh, that I am uh, straight. I have to um, to be fearful from um, what, uh, what if my family know? What if my community know? What if authorities in my country know that I am gay so I will be jailed? So that fear every day we are living uh, in uh, back home as uh, LGBTQ individuals. In the church community um, and in schools as well, I mean, there's uh, so much talk about, you know, gay straight alliances and supports for young people and do you find like in, in, in the congregation or in the greater community, is, is, is there an openness and even almost a desire or young people communicating, um, you know, the specifics of what supports they'd like to see or contribute to or participate in? Um, offhand, I can't really say. I think that's part of what being in a firm in ministry is, is like going out and building those relationships because it's our job to build the relationships. It's not the queer community's job to do the relationship building, mm. right? And so through that, that's when we can conf kind of find out what these young people are needing, right? And what's important to them. And so, um, and it could be happening in individual, like individual churches, like depending on their community within the church, that could be happening. Like they could be having the, you know, families that have children who are queer, right? And then finding out that way. So, I mean, we have like a fairly high number of people from the queer community in our congregation, but not that many who are younger, 
Right. Has so, it always been, with, you know, with regards to what you know about Robertson Wesley United Church, um, I'll, I'll let people know that, no, you know, locally, I mean, obviously we'll have audience members across the country, but for those in the metro Edmonton region, this is just off 124th Street. It's actually a stunningly mm-hmm. beautiful facility. Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful church. There's a farmer's market right outside it on the weekends, and right on a pedestrian stroll with a bunch of restaurants. It's, I would imagine it's a, it's a faith community, the brick and mortar element of it that can draw uh, people in has this been an intentional outreach like did, did, did the members of this church at some point make an intentional decision to be what did you call it not an inclusive community but what was the word affirming affirming community and, and if so how long ago was that and, and and how has that played out sure I mean it's they became affirming I believe in 2009 so okay. it's hard for me to speak to that part just you weren't because there I yet. wasn't there right, right? um so but considering some churches are still going through the process of affirming, they have been affirming for a while in that kind of way of looking at it. Um, but I can speak for me, like the reason why I was like also drawn to it is because I saw that they had the flag out. Mm. We have like pride, for, like outdoor furniture that's painted outside our church, right? There are like, there are signs to say that, you know what, like you can come here if you want to, like we see you and you can come here. Isn't it amazing that yeah. like a, a, a six inch rainbow flag sticker on a sign mm-hmm. or a flag on a flagpole outside of a, a facility or a business or what have you mm-hmm. um, can go so far mm-hmm. in in sending a message. It's like uh, I mean, it's mm-hmm. and, and not not just through June, you know, not just through Pride Month, mm-hmm. but uh, generally speaking. And you yeah. see more and more of it. I don't know if it's also serving as right now almost like, you know, when people talk about planting flags as a metaphor right now, it's it's almost like people saying that they're going to take a stand against, quite mm-hmm. frankly, some of the bullshit that they're seeing around them. Mm-hmm. Well, being an affirming ministry is one way for, you know, is the way for, you know, faith communities to be really vocal. Because you can say that you're welcoming and inclusive, but what does that actually mean? You're mm-hmm. We're welcoming and we, we include everyone except, mm-hmm. right? So going through the process, because it isn't a process to be an affirming ministry it's making like a bold statement to say that we are and we're doing our work to be in relationship with you and we celebrate you and you get to be a full member and when i say full member like there's a lot of churches out there that would not let a queer person run a youth group or a children's group right but in an affirming ministry you get to be a full member of the life of the the life of the church which is kind of the whole point totally that's why you're there we'll be back with our panelists in just a second but of course you know that these conversations don't happen without amazing real talk sponsors like our friends at athabasca university that want to remind you that right now is a perfect time for you to pursue your goal of perhaps broadening or deepening your knowledge of subject matter that's that's appealing to you maybe better preparing yourself for job opportunities you know i mean industry is changing we're talking more about things like artificial intelligence and machine learning and well there's a lot of opportunity there did you know that more than 95 percent of athabasca university grads say that they're satisfied with the quality of their education you know that more than 95 percent of their grads would recommend au to others and nearly 90 percent of grads say that they're in a job related to their field of study 90 percent Uh, There are not a lot of post-secondary institutions that can boast those numbers, but AU can. You can find out what makes Athabasca University unique and get the registration process started by visiting AthabascaU.ca. Dozens and dozens and dozens of programs and courses from undergrad all the way up to PhDs. Now, if you're graduated, if you're a professional engineer and you're looking to get your career started... Apex Automation wants to talk to you. As a matter of fact, right now they're hiring electrical engineers, instrumentation engineers, computer science process and mechanical engineers, electricians, and instrument techs. Uh, That's right. If you're interested in starting your career with Apex Automation, it's because you're intrigued by a place, you're inspired by a place that puts people over profits. And by the way, how cool would it be to work on autonomous vehicles and machinery? Hey, help those in agriculture improve their efficiencies. What about robotics? I love what they're doing in mining. They're taking human elements out of dangerous work and also opening doors of opportunity for skilled workers. It's a compelling story, and this company's growing, one of the fastest in Canada. You can find them online at apexautomation.ca. 
Uh, to keep the good news rolling, another company that's hiring right now. We love making these types of announcements. It's our friends at Kubi Renewable Energy. You can check out the careers link at kubienergy.ca to find out what it would look like to help grow clean energy in Canada. Kubi is young, they're growing, and they're reshaping Canada's energy portfolio. They're proudly based out of Edmonton and Kamloops, BC. They also are doing work in Saskatchewan, the Northwest Territories. Great opportunities for you to assist your fellow Canadians in achieving their sustainability goals. There's all kinds of cool incentives to work at Kubi Renewable Energy. You can learn more at kubienergy.ca. And we wanted to give a shout out to our friends at Complete Care Restoration. They're busy right now, and we know it's a bit of a gut punch when we talk about helping folks get back on their feet from fire damage, flood damage. I mean, this is the time of year when it gets really personal, right? Complete Care Restoration, their teams have been on the road over the past number of years helping folks in Slave Lake and Fort McMurray rebuild after wildfire. A big shout out to those firefighters that are out there on the front lines right now. If you have been impacted by fire, if you've been impacted by flood, make Complete Care Restoration your first call. We've worked with them personally, and we give them two thumbs up. You can check them out online today at completecarerestoration.ca. Our special Pride Real Talk Roundtable features Basil Abu Hamra, who's a settlement practitioner. Uh, that's such a cool job title, the settlement practitioner. Settlement just, just has a really nice, uh, sort of an authoritative vibe to it. <laughs> At the Edmonton Mennonite Center for Newcomers, uh, Becca Marcellus is joining us, a community outreach worker for Out Loud St. Albert, and Angela Glacial. Uh, at Robertson Wesley United Church. Uh, that's the church that is playing host uh, to a big conference that's coming up June 22nd. So what is this? Not too long from now. It's, it's yeah, just a, sh- a short time from now coming mm-hmm. up next weekend. Basically, uh, people can check it out online at communityandconnection.com. Uh, I see you've got a, a great lineup of speakers. Um, you want to mm-hmm. tell us kind of what, what this is all about and what, what manifested this conference? Sure. Um, it really initially came from conversations we were having at Robertson Wesley about being an affirming ministry and constantly looking at like what does that look like right and we really wanted to know that it was like it's a verb so it should be something that's active and living and then that led us to having conversations about what is happening in the queer community um, and questions like well what is what do resources and things look like now after covid um, and also just sort of all of the complex issues that the queer community is facing and so we wanted to bring together the the folks who are doing work. So the individuals, organizations who are doing work in the queer community um, and bring them together so they can share those like challenges and their issues, even their hopes about what they would like to see and stuff going forward. So that was really how the conference came about um, and just bringing all those people together. When you talk about the complex issues, maybe we can go around mm-hmm. the horn here. Can, can, can we talk about when we say the mm-hmm. complex issues that the queer community is facing? You right away, Becca, sort of nodding your head. What, what, what would be one of them? Let's, let's put these in front of people. Let's give our audience something to think about as they're listening to this podcast while they're walking their dog. Yeah, I mean, I think I can speak for, you know, all queer serving organizations that we're all having capacity issues right now just because of the high needs. Um, I know for us with uh, our youth, a lot of them who weren't in safe homes, uh, you know, who their safe place was school or their extracurriculars. When COVID hit, they lost that. And a lot of them had to go back into the closet for their own safety. Right. Um, And that did a huge number on their mental health. And they're still kind of recovering from that. Some kids haven't gone back to their extracurriculars. They don't have those outlets. Um, They're still kind of trying to rebuild their mental wellness and get back to a place where they do feel safe coming out of the closet. And so, you know, on our group nights, we, the staff, it's about a 20 to one ratio of youth to staff. Like it's, we have capacity issues, I know, yeah, everybody else says there's just such high demand right now. And anytime I talk to anybody that's involved in social services, um, and in particular supporting young people, I'm blown away in a heartbreaking way at the statistics. Mm. And when you talk about the population of young people that are living on the street or, or utilizing shelter services or what have you, disproportionately members of the LGBTQ2S plus community. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I've heard numbers as high as 70%. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that's where, I mean, 
Edmonton is lucky to have the Chew Project, who are some really amazing folks who, you know, do exactly that. They help out the queer unhoused youth um, who, yeah, had to leave home or who were kicked out um, and just try to get them, you know, the things they need because for a lot of these kids, it's just, it's about safety, right? It's a lot of them, you know, would like to come out, but they might not be able to just because they can't, you know, live on their own or they don't have another grown up that they can go to. Sure. Uh, Basil, with what you've learned, uh, did you come straight to Edmonton from Syria? Straight so you've been here for about eight years? Yeah. Coming up on 10 years. Yeah. Um, how, how would you describe Edmonton in, in the context of a, like a, you know, a safe haven or a, a destination for refugees or immigrants who might identify as, as part of, as members of the LGBTQ community? Okay, so I think uh, having the Rainbow Refugee Program put Edmonton in the map as a safe ha haven for uh, LGBTQ refugees and the newcomers. Uh, people are, uh, when they come to Canada, they come to Edmonton because they know that there is resources available for them. There is this community that have been built uh, for, uh, for, uh, for them here. Um, like through the experience, I learned that Edmonton is welcoming city. There is great people in here in Edmonton that's very supportive. Um, um, I know there is still gaps in services for lots of LGBTQ refugees and the newcomers, and uh, that's why it's important for us to to join uh, your conference um, just to spread the word and do more advocacy uh, for their rights. Um, without obviously betraying anyone's uh, personal information mm -hmm. not asking you to use names or identify yeah. anybody but to give us an idea of, of the importance of this rainbow refugee program mm -hmm. and the supports that it provides yeah. could you could you tell us a story of someone without identifying them give us an sure. example of someone other than yourself yeah. that's moved to canada un under uh, already i would assume a stressful circumstance and, and give us an idea of how the program offers those supports and has has assisted them in a big way sure so um you know, like uh, refugee uh, claimants who are LGBTQ, they arrive here alone, um, uh, very isolated. They don't have uh, family support. They are alone. Uh, they don't have community support. Their ethnocultural community, they are not accepting them. Um, so they are very isolated. So they need a place where they have a sense of community. Um, so they arrive here uh, and they uh, access shelters um, here in Edmonton. Um, and then uh, when they come to our service, we support them with immigration, find safe housing, uh, connect them to mental health support, um, supporting them with employment um, and uh, uh, spiritual connection, actually connecting them for churches that is affirming um, um, and lots of things so uh, you know like the, the when we started the LGBT newcomer group it was only seven group members now we are over than 200 um, uh, member in our group um, uh, the the immigration part of uh, the program, uh, refugee claimants, the acceptance rates before uh, uh, the existing of this service, it was 60%. Now it's over than 97%. Uh, uh, so that shows you that if there is that support, if there is that acceptance here, um, that will uh, lead for a better life for everyone and one of them, the LGBT newcomers. For most of these people, is this their first real support system this is their first real support system and yeah. what sort of what, what do they tell you what do you see you know like personally like in that group environment let me tell you we are like a family uh so they they call me the queen mother <laughs> <So> <laughs> the queen bee <laughs> the queen bee uh, <laughs> so uh you know uh they are they graving that connection to the lgbtq uh community um, um uh, like they are experiencing their first bride celebration in Edmonton. Um, you know, that's so meaningful for them to see that there is people that they are there for them. They are supporting them and show them that they can be who they are here. Um, and uh, they can, like, that's the most important thing that they need 
to thrive in our city and hopefully in this program we are supporting them to go there huh mm-hmm. you know sometimes we'll, we'll be having a round table like this and everything's like really positive and encouraging and good news and then i'm like oh don't do it because <laughs> i'm because i'm about to throw a real buzzkill under the table but but okay. this is real talk so Let's we got to be real it. right okay. so this is an, this is an email from <laughs> simon simon's one of the good guys um says i'm a teacher at an elementary school in north edmonton and uh, this week, we noticed that we had an abnormally large group of students absent, uh, writing it off as another bout of illness that runs rampant through schools. I didn't think anything of it. But then I started to get emails and calls from parents asking what we were doing for pride. And my response to these questions was that we talk about pride and that pride means being proud and feeling safe to be yourself and that everybody deserves respect and dignity for who they are. And everybody deserves the right to feel safe to be themselves at school and in society. And... Um, Parents asking about pride is not anything new, says Simon. I always get one or two every year. But this year, it seemed like the questions were endless. And I asked my colleagues if they were getting the same thing. And our office, it turns out, was getting inundated with calls and emails. Our principal reached out, and other schools were also being bombarded. And our absence rate was 30% last week, says Simon. 120 kids not attending school. Through the grapevine, I learned that there was an email or a website that had been shared telling parents to keep their kids home. You're all nodding. So <laughs> obviously, we'll get into this. Um, says, I've not found this, but uh, some of the parents have, have um, I've asked them to share it with me if they feel comfortable. But they told me it sounded sort of like anti-LGBTQ conspiracy nonsense, you know, that the, the, the tr- pride is pushing kids to be trans. And, and I was shocked at how many of our parents participated. Like, we're a very inclusive school. We celebrate Diwali. Diwali. Uh, we had an entire month talking about Ramadan, Black History Month, residential schools, uh, you know, and now it feels like we're regressing. And Simon says, so I've done a bit of digging, and it turns out that we're not the only school on the north side that's experiencing these issues. Some had uh, reported as high as a 50% absence rate last week. Um, Simon says, I'm angry. And at first I was angry at our parents, but then I realized that that was misplaced. Uh, I'm angry at whoever's sharing this hate-filled nonsense and scaring people with this BS. And every parent that reached out that had a conversation with me, I think, felt better. And their kids were at school the next day. Um, As a staff, we decided that we're not changing a thing. We will continue to celebrate pride. We will honor our community members. Uh, Simon says I'm wearing the biggest, loudest rainbow shirt I can find to school next week. We're not pushing an agenda. We are honoring and respecting community members the same way we respect and honor other community members. Inclusion means everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That from Simon. Yeah, I I have seen like a form email that was going around, just a copy paste that parents were sending to teachers about like, I hear you're going to talk about sex and gender and I don't want you to in this class and it'll be you know sent to grade two students or teachers um and I think there's this really common thing among these sorts of people to really heavily sexualize the queer community especially the trans community um which is just so wild to me right you know you get a kid you know a young kid coming out as a lesbian and it's not them saying like oh I want to have sex with girls when I grow up um you know it's oh I want to be Prince Charming who rides in and saves Sleeping Beauty like it's we all you know I'm sure a lot of us had crushes when we were very young like it wasn't about sex right and I think that's what they need to realize because it's just getting so out of hand and they say you know oh you're pushing young kids to be trans but um it's a lot easier to be cis these kids aren't choosing it (laughs) like it'd be a lot easier for them if they weren't Um, but this is who they are and research has shown that kids have a really solid view of their gender by the time they're like four years old right you know it's pretty common to see kids you know little boys wearing dresses or little girl you know like just kind of experimenting with what gender means to them and then those kids you know some of them have really affirming parents that let them kind of you know experiment and some kids are like, oh, yeah, I am cis. Like, I just, you know, played around and I decided I am what the doctor said I am. And others, not so much. And then there's some kids who, you know, will make comments about feeling like they're in the wrong body when they're very young, but then will go back into the closet because they go to school and, you know, they hear, oh, boys can't wear nail polish or, you know, girls can't, you know, play baseball or whatever. Mm. It's, yeah, I think they need to stop worrying about sex so much because it's just this very innocent like i want to be prince charming like Mm -hmm. it's as simple as that but there is there is that that is kind of like this recurring um and i'm not saying it it, it's a bullseye okay (laughs) but there is this kind of recurring 
criticism that you'll hear of pride where someone that, that will be dismissing a pride initiative will say, well, I don't know why we need to celebrate like who you want to sleep with. And it's kind of like, <laughs> well, that's not really, I mean, Angela, you're laughing, but like, it's like, that's, that's not really what it's about. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I think it's the same when people are just like, well, you know, we it's I think it falls a line the same as like well we don't have a straight parade like you still hear that like that's a classic thing yeah. like we don't have a straight parade or the white entertainment awards the white ent- yeah. yeah and that just comes from like you didn't have to you know fight for anything like it was all just sort of there for you right um, so those comments are I don't know I laugh not because it's just like but I just laugh because it's like we're still hearing them and we're hearing them so much. I know you're not laughing because you think it's funny. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We've got uh, Tara Lynn here on the live chat that says, shout out to Simon and that school. A hundred percent. Totally. Yeah. It's important. Yeah. 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 We we, we need to Mm -hmm. actually, it's a message for acceptance for everyone, not only for Mm -hmm. the LGBT community. And it's also like celebrating brides in school. It's a message for that LGBTQ kid in the school that you are seen, you are supported, and Mm -hmm. you can be your authentic self. Absolutely. And we are with you. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a a, a compliment here to the Edmonton Mennonite Center for Newcomers. I should read it. Basil, you just just got blown back in your chair and I haven't even (laughs) read it yet. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Tracy says uh, EMCN has some of the most skilled employment counselors because of their diversity and their inclusion workplace culture. Um, take us into this place. I've, I, I think, to be honest with you, and I've known the executive directors and I've interviewed people from that organization mm-hmm. for 15 years now, to mm-hmm. be honest with you. Uh, but the word Mennonite in the title always kind of threw me. Like, I guess I, I had a sort of a, a, a misunderstanding of of maybe what it was all about. Yeah. Can, can you, can you, for people that aren't familiar with what this service provides, I mean, they, they provide integral services for people that are new to Canada. Yeah. We, we provide uh, services, all kinds of services for newcomers to let them uh, thrive in our city. Now, back to the Mennonite comments, the Mennonite church, they were the founder of uh, AMCN, uh, and that back to that when the Vietnamese refugees start to come mm. uh, to Canada. Um, now, uh, and it started with two, with one staff actually uh, operating from um, a basement in a church. Now uh, we are over then 200 staff from all around the world. And Ryan, guess how many Mennonites working with AMCN? You tell me. Zero. Really? Yeah. So uh, uh, th- we just have the name uh, because they are our funders. Um, Interesting. So mm-hmm. Yeah, fascinating stuff. But we are so thankful for the Midnight Church for funding uh, EMCN. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Um, can, can we talk, like in closing, um, Angela, right out of the gates, you made a comment about Pride sort of returning to protest. And I, I want to ask the three of you, and this is not in a way for us to get angry, um, that's for later in trash talk. You guys will be, you know, in the green room by then. Mm-hmm. But like to light a fire under this audience or to, to, to share some of the fire in your bellies. You know what I mean? Um, one thing as we wrap here, uh, this could be a call to action. Uh, this, this could be like a proclamation, however you see it. One thing that you will focus your protest on this month. Um, just continuing to be loud and bring attention to things because complacency doesn't mean that you're inclusive and doesn't mean you actually support, right, or love or any of those things. Um, so just being really loud and if it means like holding other people accountable to garbage, then doing that as well. Mm. Basil, how about you? Where will you focus your protest? On advocating for more, um, uh, more um, human rights for LGBTQ around the world. Now recently Uganda introduced a new bill. Uh, it's a crucial uh, bill that, um, you know, it's so sad that we are in 2023 and there is still s- like people produ- uh, um, introduced laws like this against the LGBTQ community. Uh, so I think uh, we have a long way in advocacy and uh, we need um, you know our rights yeah you're talking in in Uganda for people that don't know um, you know this according to a BBC report Uganda's progress in tackling HIV and grave jeopardy 
um, after that country's president approved tough new anti-gay legislation. Um, the United Nations, the Americans are warning over this, an increasing number of people being discouraged in Uganda from seeking vital health services for fear of attacks and punishment. This after President Yoari Museveni signed the anti-homosexuality bill into law mm -hmm. um, among the harshest anti-LGBTQ laws in the world. Mm -hmm. um, people can learn more about that. I'm grateful that you brought that up. Uh, Becca, where is your protest focus this pride? I mean, it always comes back to our kids, really. I mean, we see young kids and teenagers having to go and pour their hearts out in, you know, seats of government, just screaming to be heard. They're marching in the streets when they should be, you know, in school and getting to be children. Um, and I think, you know, as queer adults, that's really where we come in and try to fight for them. But it's also where our allies come in because we can only do so much, right? We need our allies to kind of take some of that emotional burden, you know, have the conversation with your shitty uncle at Thanksgiving. Like, you know, if someone who's part of the queer community is in trouble, like, please step in and help them. We really need our allies at our backs to support us and help hold us up because we can only do so much. What does it mean to be an ally? You gave the one example of speaking to your shitty uncle at Thanksgiving. <laughs> But like in everyday life, for a person who feels, um, and I know that the answer is like pr pride is important to everybody. Pride, is, but for the mm. person that's like, it, it's I'm fine with it, but it's like not my thing, or it doesn't impact me, or I don't know anybody that's gay. Like they do, but they, they just don't know it. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Oh, a hundred percent. I think. I mean, Angela mentioned allyship is very much a verb. It's not a checkbox that you use to make yourself feel good. It's not a badge of honor that you can you know take off when things get uncomfortable. It's having those conversations and sometimes putting, you know, your reputation on the line a little bit and standing up for people who are trying very hard to stand up for themselves but aren't listened to. Like there are some places um, our former executive director, uh, Terry, would go into because as members of the queer community, we wouldn't necessarily be listened to or welcome. And so he, as, you know, a white, straight cis man would have a lot more power than us. Right. And so it's using those privileges that people have to help further um, the safety of the community. And that's really allyship for any marginalized group. Hmm. Layton's an ally. Layton sent us an email um, out of Westlock, Alberta. Shout out oh, to Westlock. Oh, we're going to be there next week. Are you? <laughs> yeah. What are you doing in Westlock? <laughs> well, I'm guessing it's going to come up in this email. Yeah. Well, it says on June 18th. Uh, a rainbow crosswalk will be painted on the street in support of the RF Staples High School's GSA, their mm -hmm. Gay Straight Alliance Thunder Alliance. Uh, Layton says it's been voted on and approved by the town council, um, but due to scheduling, they can only close the road on a Sunday, which happens to be Father's Day. And uh, so there's somebody out there, um, Benita Peterson, says she's been local, you know, very vocal against this and is rallying her troops. Uh, this is a familiar name for people in the area. She's reached out, says Layton, to my underage daughter over Facebook to have her take down her petition in support of the endeavor. Um, and though her message is not threatening violence, she is reaching out to other kids in the GSA. Layton says, so my wife and I have filed a restraining order. Mm -hmm. um, and although the uh, mayor, Ralph Larriger, has told us there will be police attendance there on the 18th, the local cops have told us they will not attend unless there is an emergency. Layton says, I feel like this is crossing boundaries, people reaching out to children in bullying and harassing manners. Um, these posts are spreading hate. Um, and he says, and I'm willing to speak out against this. And Layton, we appreciate you doing so. Is oh, this, yeah. This has been on your radar? Oh, yeah. We love the Laytons of the world. Um, yeah, no, it is. We unfortunately aren't able to make it to the crosswalk painting, um, but we are going to go hang out with the GSA kids for a bit um, because, yeah, like adults and strangers are targeting them and sending them hate to you know, children. And it's just so unbelievably inappropriate um, that, yeah, they can't even, you know, it's the whole like pick on someone your own size kind yeah. of thing, right? Yeah. It's like, if you have a problem, like talk to an adult, right? Well, don't I don't want to use, I, I never want to use the word easy because life is not easy for, for a young queer kid or at least for a lot of them, right? So I don't want to say it's easier uh, to be in a GSA, and let's point out as well, there's straight kids that participate in GSAs too. It's, yeah. it's young people participate, yeah. gathering in friendship and, and community. Um, you know, it's easier in an urban center. Well, who knows? Who's to say? These are all individual cases. But let me put it this way. Shout out to the kids that participate in GSAs in perhaps more hostile territory, mm -hmm. in communities that are a little bit smaller, 
a little bit more conservative, where the magnifying glass is a lot more intense, where pushback is obviously clearly right in their face all the time. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, no, those kids are um, very brave. And we just send all the love in the world to them and to the people who are going to go and, you know, counter protest and stand up for this, you know, symbol from the community that the queer community, you know, they've got their back. Yeah. Real Talk's got your back, too. Shout out to Westlock and the kids there in that GSA uh, community and connection. Um, the uh, 2S LGBTQIA plus advocacy conference goes June 22nd through the 24th at Robertson Wesley United Church, just off 124th Street in Edmonton. The speaker lineup's fantastic, um, including Poet Laureate Emeritus Nisha Patel, which is really great. And I mean, you've got singer songwriters and performers and educators. Who is this for? Well, we really wanted to make sure that this was for the queer community, hearing from the queer community. So um, that was our number one thing. Um, so just hearing directly from them. But it's also open and welcome to the greater community as well, because there's a lot of value in that. And Becca has just talked about like allyship and what's. And so learning more about these experiences and what's happening right now in the community, um, that will help you if you want to you know, do the work to be an ally, right? So it's really, it's open to everyone. Yeah. And, and thank you to the yeah. wonders of the World Wide Web. You can yeah. live, check out the live stream for part of it, which we, is really neat as we well. Do, yeah. So if somebody hears about this, you know what we found out? Johnny told me the other day, we were looking at the countries where people are listening to and watching Real Talk. We've got like a, a very large, interestingly large contingent of audience members in the Philippines for some reason. Yeah. Wow. So shout out to the Philippines this morning. So, you know, you never know. You may, you may have people hitting your website from all mm -hmm. over the place um, mm -hmm. that could find great meaning in what you're doing. Again, communityandconnection.com. Still some tickets available. Yes. And, of course, we'll put that web link uh, in the show notes right here on, uh, mm -hmm. on the podcast and on YouTube. Um, that's Angela Glacial. Uh, a member of Robertson Wesley United Church. You've been hearing from Becca Marcellus from Out Loud St. Albert and Basil Abu Hamra, uh, Abu Hamra, who's uh, played a key role in establishing the Rainbow Refugee Program. I'm so embarrassed to tell you, I had never heard of it before, and I am so glad I know about it. It just is, it, it's one of those things when you hear about it and you go, that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that that's happening in Edmonton. It makes me proud to be an Edmontonian, mm -hmm. that my fellow Edmontonians like you are dedicating your life to this. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. And a big shout out to everybody there that's doing that. Thank you so much. And thank you for helping us spread the word around mm -hmm. this uh, amazing program. Absolutely. And, and this is where you come in, Real Talkers. If there's somebody that you know uh, would glean a whole lot of benefit from hearing this roundtable, from hearing these three speak about their personal experiences and what they see in the world around them. Please do share this interview. It's easy to do if you're listening to it on the podcast. You just go down, uh, depending on your provider. Typically, you just hit share, or you can tell people where to find our YouTube channel and spread the word as Real Talk celebrates pride. Thanks to the three of you. This conversation was presented by Real Talk sponsors like our friends at Eden Landscaping. You can check them out online at landscapeedmonton.ca, bringing outdoor spaces to life. This is a bit of a unique one, a unique relationship because we are working with Eden Landscaping. They're helping us reinvent our backyard. This wasn't working for us anymore. You know, young kids that want to kick the soccer ball around and two big dogs that, well, you know what dogs do to real grass, right? And we wanted to integrate the trampoline but not have it look tacky. And uh, am I speaking your language? So Mike and his team have helped us with just a beautiful free-flowing design. And oh yeah, we didn't have a million dollars to spend either so we've been able to see them work with our budget which has given me such great confidence in recommending Eden Landscaping to you if this is the summer where you're going to take your outdoor space to the next level I encourage you to work with Eden Landscaping at landscapeedmonton.ca speaking of getting outside are you going to be barbecuing this weekend chances are yes right i mean if you're anywhere near where we are the forecast is absolutely unbelievable it's barbecue season and june is pork month at friesen brothers 16 different locations across the province of alberta and they've got you covered you want pork belly you want ribs you want their fantastic thick cut bacon 
or maybe you want to check out their Ivan's Sausage. Four different flavors of custom sausage made in store by their real butchers. There's great tutorials. If, if you want to figure out how to perfectly grill, for example, a heritage cut, Alberta pork saddleback chop. Look at this thing. Are you kidding me? You can find the resources online at Friesen.com. That's F-R-E-S-O-N.com. Nothing beats the heat like a Dairy Queen blizzard from the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. And this June, they're rolling out the June blizzard treat of the month. It's the Reese's Caramel Pretzel Blizzard Treat. You know, summer should be one big adventure for you and your taste buds. And the new Reese's Caramel Pretzel Blizzard Treat is here to take you on the adventure of a lifetime. We're talking about crunchy pretzel and peanut trails leading up to a world-famous DQ soft serve peak. You know how they do that, right? The indulgent peanut butter cup cliffs over a river of decadent caramel bliss. I'm not a tour guide. I'm just describing the June blizzard treat of the month at the Dairy Queens in Palisades, the Mayo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road. You kind of are a tour guide for Dairy Queen, though. If I, anyone was an expert, it'd be you. I will tour you through any of the Dairy Queens of Northwest <laughs> Edmonton and Sherwood Park on a taste thrill ride. Yeah. We're going to start with a signature stack burger. We're going to go in. If I'm the tour guide, we're in gonna the car. Hit, we're going to hit the onion rings in the car, in the parking lot. <laughs> I've been talking to Wyatt about brain freeze. I said, kiddo, you got to kind of chill out on crushing those blizzards, you know? like you, you, you Painful. Gotta, you got to be careful with that. <laughs> you got to be careful. And did you catch Professor Lisa Young in studio on Monday, by the way? Uh, you can find it anywhere you get your podcasts or, of course, on our YouTube archive as well. You'll find it our June 5th episode. Populism is what's good for politicians, good for you. This interview was based on Dr. Young's piece. It's the cover piece in this month's issue of Alberta Views magazine. It's the big choice, individualism or the common good. It's her commentary on how Albertans voted and what it says through that Alberta election period. That's the June issue of Alberta Views. You know, if you use our promo code to subscribe to Alberta Views magazine, they're going to knock 50% off. 50% 50% off. That's 20 bucks for 10 issues delivered right to your door. Come on. This is the magazine for engaged citizens. You can subscribe at albertaviews.ca. The promo code AVRJ. That's Alberta Views, Ryan Jesperson. AVRJ. The promo code that's going to knock 50% off a one year subscription. That's 10 issues of Alberta Views. No brainer. It is a no brainer. Yeah. Great panel today. Way to go. Wasn't that good? Yeah, and and what do you see here? You see three very calm, intelligent people. Yeah. And what do you hear from the straight community all the time when they're against pride? Is mm. you know they're trying to yell and ram things down our throat. I didn't hear any of that today. Trying to recruit kids to be trans. Oh, and, you know, I it, thought Becca's point was great when she said, you know, it is. It's funny. It's always the straight community that is bringing sex and sexualization with children into this. Mm. Like when you see a, a young boy holding a young girl's hand, what's the first thing you think? Aww. What's the difference if it's a, a boy and a boy and a girl and a girl? Why are mm. you always making it about sex mm. with children? It's mm. never the pride community, the LGBTQ plus community that does it. It's always the straight community. And it's always the straight community. I'm sorry. Not all of them as, as well. There's tons of people who are supportive, but that are up in arms about things, frothing at the mouth. It's, I don't know. In this day and age, it still boggles my mind that people just can't, Dress how they want, love who they want, be who they want, say what they want without fear of being, like Becca said, (laughs) not that it's a bad thing, but like, do you think these kids want to go through this? Do you think it's any easier trying to be yourself than it would be to just fit in and just go along with what everyone else says? So. And, you know, you hear these discouraging stories, and, and I want to be clear. I mean, we we read uh, emails today from uh, Simon and, and Leighton, mm-hmm. and, and uh, I think we said Marlene. I don't remember the name we used mm-hmm. to protect uh, the anonymity of one of our audience members, but but there were more. Like, yeah. There's, there's more emails, and we appreciate that. And, and it's a bit of a gut punch, too. I acknowledged it in the conversation where he's – you know, everything's like positive. The conversation's really positive. And then you're like, here's another shitty thing. Here's I was going to mention that. Th- it, another it thing sucks. to bum you out. It sucks that we have to talk about those And we're things. not even talking about some of the stories we've seen locally in Western Canada. I saw one story out of Ontario the other day. There's a lot. There's way and worse people will going report on. them on Twitter yeah. and on their Instagram where, you know, a community will come together and 
uh, paint a stairway in, in you know the the rainbow mm-hmm. uh, or they'll paint a crosswalk or something like that and we've all seen the stories mm-hmm. and then someone will come by with like tar or, or black paint and deface it or ruin it or, or take their you know, truck and th- make skid marks make big on skid marks it. through yeah. the crosswalk it's horrible. And, and um and you know what the 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 consistent response from allies and advocates and community members is that's why pride is important <laughs> yeah. like you know the the it, it's like in that sort of ironic way yeah. you know by you defacing and disgracing a pride initiative reiterate the importance of the pride initiative yeah. you know it's like, why why are we afraid of rainbows i don't get it and why are we turning all rainbows in like making it about the issue too as well like i saw a video of some guy in walmart like picking up shirts with rainbows on them kids shirts and being like look they're trying to indoctrinate arch i'm like dude there's always been rainbows on kids shirts like why are you trying the issue is just it's ridiculous yeah, to me. And and it's, actually johnny you know the if, if you look me. at it in history infuriates me the rainbow's always actually been used for indoctrination. <laughs> but also, I, I forget who made the point on the panel, but I thought it was a great thing, like, with the drag thing. Like, women weren't even allowed to be in theater or act until, like, I think it was the early 1700s. Men were always in drag. Men were always dressing up as women for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Why is it a big thing nowadays? Well, and people were talking about, like, Mrs. Doubtfire or Milton Berle or, like, I mean, what about MASH? Like, like I mean, like there, there's there's a million examples, right? You can go on. I love MASH. I should watch that again. MASH is such a good show. <laughs> um, I can't say I haven't watched it for 30 years, but I remember yeah. it being a good show. But it's funny, like, that show was so long ago, and you look at today, and it feels like, and I don't want to say it because it's negative, but we're taking steps backward with all this bullshit mm. with all these petitions online from parents that and it's 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 a vocal minority we see it's like 200 people sign a petition because they don't want a rainbow crosswalk in a community of like you know 10 20 thousand people it's it's just and it's you say oh i'm thinking about the kids well think about them because those kids out there who have these feelings who don't feel like themselves who want to live the way, the way they want to live you're just you're just setting them up for failure and sadness and destroying their lives. And I loved what Becca said, like, let them experiment, let them, Hey, maybe they end up this way or that, but like, don't try to put them in this box. No, But does anybody like, actually think that there's any human in history that got tricked? In, <laughs> yeah, you into, know what I mean? <laughs> and, and like over the course of 30 or 40 years, yeah. just never wised up. And they just found themselves like yeah. on their deathbed. They were like, I, I was tricked. They're in an the expose on TV after uh, like, I, was tricked. I could have lived a straight life. I Damn love it. this from Lorraine on our chat. She says, great discussion. I'm going to listen to it again. Uh, Lorraine says, love is love is love. Steph says, I'm a, I'm a, here's a straight person checking in, supporting. I've been supporting the LGBTQ community my entire life, my whole life. And I've taught my kids the same um, and I love this. Where was the comment I saw it earlier? Someone just said there are there are more allies, and I think that they're speaking to young people. There will be people that are discovering Real Talk for the first time. This might be you listening on your headphones right now. You never even heard of this show before, and Hi. somebody shared it with you. Welcome. <laughs> uh, but somebody says here in our live chat, and and the chat's going too fast, so I've lost it. But said there's more allies than you know, um, and I would say prove it. You know, you can yeah. do, you can do small things to support people in your community, uh, including maybe considering th- they didn't ask us here today, but maybe considering a donation to one of the groups that yeah. was represented here. We all know someone in this community now. And if you of don't, course. it's because that person is probably still not free to express themselves the way they want to. So yeah. by you thinking, I don't know anyone, this is a small minority. Maybe the someone in earshot of what you're saying right now is someone in this community who yeah. still is waiting for you to be accepting. 80s fan if I check in insane Monty Python, Kids in the Hall. All I mean, there's, of like, it. there's a million examples. And nobody said anything about it then. Why are we talking about it today? Well, I don't because get it. It's because it works politically. Exactly. Because you can get people fired up and pissed off and motivated and, and politicians are doing it. Our first guest yesterday, politics is a religion nowadays. Irshad Manji, how amazing quote. was she? I loved it, yeah. Yesterday's episode, if you missed it, an absolute banger. Uh, Irshad Manji, author of the New York Times bestseller, Don't Label Me, joined us in studio for about 20 minutes, um, just like knocked our socks off. She's just a remarkable human. Um, talking about moving from polarization to collaboration. And and is it true? Are we more polarized now than ever before? And if so, number one, how did we get here? And number two, how do we get out of here? Um, and, and by the way, 
well, spoilers, she, she says we're not more polarized now than ever before. If you want to hear her make the case, the algorithm. Uh, make sure you check out, yeah, check out uh, that interview. And then, of course, on the heels of that interview, no big deal, the premier of Alberta, Danielle Smith, joined me in that same chair uh, for about 25 minutes. The and um, well, the feedback on that all fired up. Uh, we appreciate hearing from those of you that, uh, you know, we're, we're grateful. She was your choice. You voted conservative and you were happy to hear her on the show. And we appreciate the feedback from those of you that voted another way that have, quite frankly, no use for the United Conservatives and for their platform. It, it reminds us, it reiterates to us uh, that this is a diverse community that's not afraid to hit issues head on and have real conversations. Now, there was one fact check in particular that I'm grateful for. As a matter of fact, this is one that I should have caught during the interview. We want to go to the video and here? No, it's, uh, <laughs> I'm going to tee up uh, this Friday tradition first. Oh. Uh, we've never done this before. This is a new twist on uh, a weekly tradition. It's presented by our friends at Local Environmental Services. Uh, it's a little something, if you're a regular, you know. We call it Trash Talk! All right, so I'm chatting with Premier yesterday, and I say to her... You know, what's your plan? Or do you have a plan? Or do you care about reaching out to moderate or progressive conservatives that lent their votes to the NDP? Some of them did it on the record, like former Minister of Municipal Affairs, Doug Griffiths, and former Deputy Premier under Alison Redford, Thomas Lukasik. Uh, do you have plans to reach out to them? And, and sort of here's how that played out on Thursday's Real Talk. Is winning back moderate or progressive conservatives a priority for you? And if so, how will you do it? Well, you have to remember that Thomas Lukasik and Doug Griffiths both quit the caucus when Jim Prentice tried to bring the parties together. So they haven't been part of the conservative movement for a long time. Okay, so I'm on the sideline of a soccer game yesterday and I get a text message from the former <laughs> deputy premier and it says, please call me. And I went, oh boy. So I check out Thomas Lukasik's Twitter and he says to the premier, it's a bold lie. He says, Danielle, can you be honest just once? He says, Doug Griffiths resigned his seat in protest to your floor crossing. And Thomas says, I resigned cabinet in 2014 to run for the PC leadership. And then I ran as a PC in 2015. What are you talking about? He says, please apologize to Doug and me. Well, Doug Griffiths chimes in and says, to be specific, I left the caucus meeting as Danielle entered. I said I would not sit in caucus with her because she has no integrity. They asked me to hold off my resignation. I resigned two days before the next caucus meeting in January, live on Ryan's show, which is true. I'll never forget that. So there you have it. Thomas and Doug pushing back, saying that is not accurate at all. In Thomas's case, most especially not accurate. He resigned to seek the leadership, then ran again. You remember he lost in Edmonton Castle Downs. It was one of the more surprising losses of that 2015 election, the orange wave. The other one, probably Lori Blakeman, the Alberta Liberal MLA that had been serving in Edmonton Center, right? David Shepard took her out. Thomas and Lori joined me for a roundtable on my previous radio show a few days after the mm -hmm. election. Can you believe we called it the Losers Lounge? <laughs> they were such good sports about it. But it was an amazing and emotional conversation for those two. So, Thomas, thanks for reaching out. Thanks for keeping our show on the toes. And for the rest of you, thanks for being in touch and sharing what you think about. Thanks for not holding back. Thanks for telling us how subject matter resonates with you. And thanks for telling us what you'd like to hear in future on shows to come. You can send us an email anytime to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Trash Talk is presented by Local Environmental Services. Keep it local at localenvironmental.ca. Johnny and I are off next week, which means we'll be back the Monday after. We'll keep you posted. Sign up to our weekly email by scrolling to the bottom of the page at ryanjesperson.com. And, of course, follow us on TikTok, Instagram, and where else are we? Twitter at RealTalkRJ. Make it a great Friday, friends. We'll talk to you soon.